70 years ago in the 1950s, the Thames River, which flows through London, England, was biologically dead. After centuries of abuse, industrial waste, untreated human sewage, rainwater washing off the streets, nothing could live in the river. Ten years ago, the International Thieves Water Prize was awarded to the British agency responsible for cleaning up the Thames. Life had not only returned, but sensitive fish and aquatic species were back. Otter, sea trout, and salmon had returned. The last recorded salmon in the Thames had been in 1833. Over the years, millions of British pounds were invested to reintroduce salmon to the Thames, but without success. Once they were back, scientists did a little investigating and the salmon that had returned were not stock salmon. The salmon that had returned had repopulated the Thames from nearby rivers. Once it was found that the fish were reintroducing themselves, one of the scientists investigating the salmon DNA said, it's about getting the river system right, then the fish will do the rest. Today, I want to speak with you about how we influence nature, but we are not in control of nature. And there is a dire need for us to move into the right frame of mind to truly understand our predicament as a species that relies on nature for our survival so that we will be prepared to adapt as needed over the coming decades and generations. So I've been talking about rivers and fish at a climate change event. Why? <laughs> Everything is connected. For scientific purposes, we break things into component parts, and that's been very useful for building scientific understanding. We study carbon in the atmosphere and in plants. We research water as it cycles from the sky to the land and back. We research soils and air and plants and animals and humans who are somehow separate and perceived to be above it all. However, this reduction to parts has come at a cost of seeing the interconnected and exquisite ways our planet functions as a whole. We've changed the balance of carbon in the atmosphere and that is influencing water. For example, warmer air causes higher evaporation which changes how much water is stored in the atmosphere, in vegetation, and in soils. We're seeing more intense storms, like the snow that buried St. John's Newfoundland last winter. With climate change, we're also changing the chemistry of the oceans, making them more acidic. The scientist who first realized that more acidic oceans would inhibit sea creatures forming their shells threw up when she made that link. There are many indications that the water cycle is changing as a consequence of more carbon in the atmosphere. Climate change is not just about the climate. Climate change is about the planet, all of the systems on the planet, because in reality, anything we talk about is just one part of a whole functioning system, including humans. We're not separate from the functions of the planet. And just as your earlobes are ultimately connected with your toes by your blood circulation, water interconnects all life on Earth. We've been making changes to rivers, lakes, and oceans much longer than we've known about climate change. The salmon left the Thames over 150 years ago because the habitat would no longer support them. The Earth is now going through a mass extinction of plants and animals that has not been seen since the dinosaurs disappeared. But it's not a meteor hitting the planet this time. It's us. Our way of life is destroying and disrupting habitat, like the pesticides that are killing bee colonies. And this year's Living Planet Report by the World Wildlife Fund estimates that freshwater species populations, 
fish, frogs, mussels, and others have declined by an average of 84% since 1970. 84% in 50 years. And we know that aquatic habitats are directly disrupted by dams and dredging and waste discharges to water. But we don't think about as often is that any change on the land is also a change in the water. Think of a forest, for example, and imagine how much water a single mature tree holds. If you've ever been camping and tried to start a fire with wet wood, you'll know there's a lot of water in a tree. Also, the tree leaves break the fall of rain, so the raindrops hit the ground with less momentum, which means less erosion, which protects water quality. And the tree also sends water back into the atmosphere through transpiration. Cutting down trees directly influences the way water cycles from land to sky and back. And changing land use, whether it's for cities, for industry, for resource extraction like forestry, changes how water flows through rivers, where it falls as precipitation, the chemistry of rivers and lakes, and the quality of habitat for creatures living in the water and elsewhere. And we also know that the trees sequester carbon from the atmosphere and provide shade and cooling effects. The interconnections and balances within ecosystems are elegant and magnificent. And perhaps our ability to eliminate species has given us a misplaced sense of power over nature. We don't control nature, but we are capable of destroying parts of it. And we are purposely tearing at the very web of life that is our lifeline on this planet. Climate change is making species at risk even more vulnerable. We, humans, cannot live as a sole species on this planet. We need other life forms to support us. So what can be done? Well, the second most important thing we can do is clean up our mess and restore habitat. Take the Thames, for example. The first thing that happened was that people said, enough. We don't want a biologically dead river. That started a process to develop a long-term vision for a healthy Thames and a 100-year plan to restore habitat. The plan is backed up by a significant budget and public will to implement it. We should expect our leaders to have a long-term vision, not five years, not 20, but a long-term vision for habitat restoration as a top priority. As individuals and consumers, we can cease buying using pesticides on lawns and in gardens. We can avoid buying products with microbeads and single-use plastics. We can stop expecting to get what we want when we want it at any cost to the planet, like strawberries in February. We can plant trees, but not just any tree. We can plant native trees and plants that will support the bugs and birds in our own backyards. We can become informed about the environment. For example, walk your watershed. Everyone lives in a watershed that is ultimately connected to an ocean. Get curious about the little creek or stream collecting rainwater that flows off where you live and your place of work. Corkstown, for example, is in the Dawn watershed, which is connected to Lake Ontario, which flows out the St. Lawrence River and out to the Atlantic Ocean. Knowing more about our connectivity with nature helps us support political and other leaders in decision making. Restoring habitat is not a fast and easy fix, but we got into this predicament of species loss one decision at a time over many decades. Recovery of the Thames is fragile because of climate change. So the Thames restoration plan is reviewed regularly to make changes as needed. That is to adapt to changing conditions. And just as we had to adapt from being children to making decisions as adults, 
we need to change our way of life to reduce our impact on other species. Some of the native trees we plant may not survive in warmer conditions because of climate change. We need to be open and flexible in response to what nature does. And restore habitat wherever you are because cities are not separate from nature. So if restoring habitat is the second most important thing we can do, what's the number one thing we can do? We need to foster the humility to recognize that nature has a power beyond our control. We cannot dominate nature. Yes, she includes cute and cuddly animals, some of which we can domesticate. Nature is also the power of hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes, fire, lightning. She is carbon. She is water. She is the ocean currents. And she is us. We're part of nature. And now that we've influenced the climate to change, we need to adjust our attitude from one of assuming we're in charge to one of adapting, restoring the natural environment, and being flexible in response to what nature does next. We need a healthy dose of respect for nature. And if we open to our natural reverence for nature, we will also benefit from the abundance on this planet and the gratitude that that brings from the numerous and endless opportunities to experience beauty and for all of the diverse life forms that support us here on Earth.